Okay, so this is the October 17th meeting of SIG Auth. First on the agenda today is an announcement. Uh, Jordan, would you like to take this one? Sure. Um, as we talked about last time, um, I'm going to step down from SIG Auth chair, and I nominated Mo, who was willing to do cherry things and uh, feedback on it was good. So got merged yesterday. Um, I think as I opened up the kind of follow-up thread about finishing up the sub project PR, um, that's still in progress. So uh, hopefully we can get that work through and get our actual projects and work items and things enumerated. But uh, for now, Mo can help with uh, organization and uploading videos and running meetings and stuff. So congratulations. Yeah, thanks Mo for stepping up and helping out. You can always use more help. And thank you, Jordan, for your past contributions. You were SIG Auth chair for uh, a couple years, huh? Yeah, seems like forever, but. Good run. Yeah. <laughs> your, uh, I, your mic is uh, a little broken, I think, or not it working. Sound like you're breathing hydrogen or helium or something. <laughs> Did that fix it? Yeah. Okay, I, I have no idea. My mic does this every so often, and I sound like a chipmunk, and I don't know why. It's, it's those Linux laptops. It, sadly, it <laughs> actually be those Linux laptops. <sighs> awesome. So, I think uh, we'll start, uh, start pushing on the um, sub-projects, and uh, TL evolution and try to finalize uh, some of the um, or or make concrete some of the some of the things we declared in our SIGOTH charter, which we've been pretty slow uh, to achieve. So um, I think we should prioritize that, keep pushing on it. Uh, so if anybody hasn't seen it and cares about it. Uh, check out the subprojects uh, PR. And once uh, that is merged, we'll go and backfill all the owner's files. That that PR actually points to a bunch of owner files that does not don't exist yet. Um, uh, so we'll go and backfill the owner files, make them up to date because I think they came about pretty organically. And uh, once that's in, we'll. Uh, Jordan, I think you sent out an email about uh, a proposal for how to pick the initial TLs, but I think it's just um, going to be, if I can paraphrase, it would be owners um, of a large portion of the sub-projects declared. Yeah, I'll link in that thread too. Cool. I was awesome. gonna ask, is there, um... Uh, are like chair and like technical need and the other positions mutually exclusive? No, no, okay. they're not. In fact, our initial charter stated that the uh, TLs would be submitted by the chairs initially. Is that correct? Or was that language removed before it was merged? Um, I've remember. lost track so many times of what the steering committee directed to be done. I think that was in our original copy. And then before it merged, it got uh, pointed to the sort of standard one that doesn't actually describe how they get seated. Okay. Uh, so no, they are not uh, mutually exclusive to answer your question. Awesome. Uh, so let's move on to polls of note. Uh, Jordan, do you want to talk about node restriction? Yeah, um, we're just trying to make forward progress on um, node self-labeling. Uh, 
there is work in progress right now around topology uh, updates for things like CSI drivers um, that want to start having um, drivers add topology labels to nodes, which can be okay, but we want to make sure that if that's done, it's done intentionally instead of kind of accidentally introducing self-labeling updates and then a release later realizing that this is now backwards compatible behavior that we have to like honor and not ever break. Um, so this, the PR linked, um, keeps nodes from updating or adding labels uh, outside the standard default set. So today they don't do that. Um, the only labels they update are the operating system, architecture, zone, region. There's a set of like six or seven labels that they modify. Uh, and so we want to keep them to that set until we figure out how to allow additional ones in a controlled way. Um, so this is this is a trying to trying to put a stake in the ground and saying here's where we're at. Let's not go further without considering how we're going to authorize this. Um, so that that's what this PR is. Um, the community 911 uh, issue that Mike opened a while ago is still trying to explore what possible methods we would use for describing this set of labels or this set of label prefixes is fine for kubelets to modify, um, but we're trying to sync up with SigNode and SigStorage on what their intended use cases are. So that's what that's about. Yeah, I would, the idea of configuration scares me. Uh, static configuration on as an admission control webhook is going to be uh, painful and not wieldy. Um, I would really like to push towards well-known, well, well-known label formats for the for the prefixes. Um, it seems like the use cases that have been uh, put forth for cubelet self-labeling can be solved with well-known labels and well-known label prefixes. Um, I think the main concern is legacy. Uh, take CSI driver, for example. Uh, it seems reasonable that we pick a, like, a path such as CSI storage plugin dot kdes.io and say anything that has this subdomain or will or any label as the subdomain is able to uh, be self-labeled by the kubelet. Um, unfortunately, considering that's not the way the labels are today, I think that might be problematic. Um, well, there are no CSI added labels. There are no CSI added labels. I, my understanding was that they had already picked a label scheme and that they had deployed it. Uh, is that not the case? That is my understanding, but um, so we might actually have time to fix that label if we want to, if people feel as strongly about avoiding configuration as I do. Yeah, I, I think static configuration is going to be a non-starter. I think dynamic configuration, that doesn't bother me as much as it sounds like it bothers you. But if we can do it, if we can do it, pre prefixes were my original thought and seemed the most um, most well. It seemed the easiest to understand. It it does mean that we have to know and account for all the use cases that you might want to label a node to label itself, and so or not having as they come about as they add them as they come up, I. I think like a catch all for people to prototype in would be useful and then have ones for very specific um, mm -hmm. use cases. I, I, I just know people are using the, uh, the register with labels option today and to tell them there is no way for you to allow those labels that you 
already we're adding and I think like, register with labels is fine. Does your PR even remove the ability to No, but if you if a node can create itself with any labels at once, like we have to we have to figure that out as well. I think that's my PR is just dealing with update. That's a different problem. And it's much less critical in my view, because if a label can, if a node can on creation set its own labels, then it has not run user workload. As soon as the, the node runs user workload, it drops in, it, in its trustworthiness, in my, my opinion. Um, um. Hmm. Well, that's true once we no longer let them delete themselves. Yeah, exactly. All right, that, that's interesting. I'll have to think about that. Uh, okay. Where do we want to coordinate communication discussion around the, uh, the config stuff? Do we want to do it still around 9-11 or do we want to have a meeting? It seems, I mean, I know time for 113 is short. It seems like we should probably get storage and node and auth folks who are interested like together to talk through this and um, yeah i don't i don't uh have too much of an opinion if you want to take it over uh and drive it in 112 is this that is that this release um 113 uh that's fine with me i probably yeah. will not have time to Okay, I will probably start a thread with the three sigs and invite people who are interested to uh, to try to hammer out what we're going to do with this. Cool. Any other thoughts on that? If not, we can move on to the next pool of interest. Um, authenticator interface change. So this is uh, an interface change to the authenticator interfaces, uh, which is an internal-ish interface. Um, it is exposed in the uh, KDS.io API server library. So it is not entirely internal. Um, it's possible. It's possible that this interface will break downstream uh, dependence on the uh, API server library. Um, the motivation for this change is to um, plumb server context down to authenticators uh, and to uh, expand uh, the return value to support uh, returns returned information outside of the uh, authentication user, the user info. Um, so we want to plumb context. Uh, two things that I think are valuable uh, that we get by plumbing context is we get um, propagation of um, of uh, cancellation to the webhook authenticator and the uh, OIDC authenticator, which both uh, do, can do network uh, calls. Um, so, and the, the big one is we can plumb through uh, an audience, which is the uh, uh, expected audience of the authentication call. So this is, uh, will be useful for supporting a token review uh, for, um, uh, token review for audiences that are not the API server. So right now, uh, we in audience aware authenticators, we assume that the audience is the API server audience. And in uh, token unaware authenticators, we just authenticate anything and ignore audience. Uh, so this is problematic. Uh, we want to move to a place where token aware authenticators only authenticate tokens uh, that uh, when the audience is the API server and that token aware audiences have enough information uh, to authenticate uh, tokens for multiple audiences, such as a vault audience, if the 
uh, authentication happen through a token review flow from Vault. Um, yeah, so I am breaking up a really big P PR um, that slipped in 111 and then I, that I didn't make much progress on in 112. Um, and this is a piece of it. It's a pretty big change because uh, it changes a um, uh, large, uh, dependent on um, interface. So um, does anybody have feedback on this? I've been working with Mo and Jordan to uh, get the interface to something reasonable. I get the audience part. I wasn't sure what you meant by cancellation. What, is it, what does that mean? So essentially, um, this is a minor uh, improvement. Uh, right now, if you send a bunch of authentication requests to the API server and you uh, control C or whatever, uh, if you are using the webhook authenticator, those um, those backend RPCs will not be canceled um, because we don't propagate cancellation. So, uh, op, uh, ideally, we would uh, cancel the backend RPCs and propagate that cancellation uh, beyond past the webhook um, in that circumstance. But it's it's a minor uh, improvement compared to uh, propagate uh, propagating audience expected audience to the authenticators. Yeah, okay, thanks. Cool, well, if uh, everybody take a look, I'm probably gonna push on getting that in because it's really big and will uh, certainly need to be rebased if it stays open for two more weeks. Um, I think I think six months of consideration is probably sufficient. <laughs> I mean, if we don't know what to do now, we should probably. We'll be much smarter six months from now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask, since this does touch the Cube API server, is there anything special we have to do for that? Uh, how do you mean? Since you're changing the interface, I, I'm, uh, I'm more, I, I guess yeah. it's still inside the staging repos and the bots will just push it out. And those repos don't have like backwards compatibility guarantees, right? So it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jordan, do you know about the stability guarantees of those libraries? As far uh, as I know, we don't have any. Yeah, so client go is the only one that has like cuts major versions every release. Um, the API machinery ones have a goal of getting to like go compatible, go compatibility guarantees, but they haven't gotten there yet. Um, so an interface change like this, um, an interface change is actually preferable to like silently changing behavior uh, and not letting anyone who's using you know that stuff has changed up from under them. Um, yeah. If you, yeah, if you count on Go API compatibility, you are disappointed every release. That's what I thought was going to be the answer. I just wanted to confirm to make sure there wasn't some other tenants we were violating. Awesome. And we uh, had a small discussion about why we don't just shove the data into um, uh, the extra field. And I totally agree with uh, Mike. We should not just shove uh, data inside the extra field. Yeah. The, the, the thing that we're talking about here is not an attribute of the user, it's an attribute of the credential they're using. Yeah, yeah. And we've also in in internally in our current uh, uh, internal authentication system, we're walking back a bunch of um, attributes that we exposed initially in um, in the in this in a similar proto. Um, it, ended up causing a bunch of 
issues because we had a, a bunch of clients of authentication of the authentication system, depending on uh, internal features, opening these things up, implementing ad hoc uh, author uh, authorization systems and ad hoc logging systems based on them. Um, we, it made it difficult for us to, um, to uh, eventually that, that cruft built up and it, it made it difficult for us to, um, make uh, broad changes to authorization just because you would have to go fix every single client. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that we want to consider here. We should probably consider it. Um, it might not, we not, might not have the same issues in Kubernetes, uh, but yeah, I would tend to recommend caution when adding to the extra info. Cool. All right. Um, let's, let's grab the next one. Um, this is migrate service count volume to a projected volume. Um, how big of a change is this? The projected volume has been around since one six. So we have are far beyond the date where we guarantee compatibility with uh, cubelets that are one six. Um, we can do this change uh, without um, a feature flag and within our API guarantees uh, it should work. Um, this paves the way for us to sub in a uh, config map uh, projection uh, once we have the config map controller merged, which uh, somebody is working on right now. And uh, once we have um, the token uh, request project or token, what is it, service count token projection uh, in uh, beta for two or three releases or however long we wait, we can just sub in a uh, service count token projection and we will no longer have uh, use for the secrets. Um, so I'm wondering like how, would this, how would this break if I had a one five cubelet and everything was telling me to use a service account projection? Uh, it would break if you were wanting, running a one thirteen API server. The cubelet would not understand the projected volume type. Yeah, so a seven version skew between API server and kubelet. I know that sounds crazy, but um, I don't know how other people, other people's environments exist, but we have a non-zero amount of clusters that do that in GKE. Uh, but they're, they're, we, they can't possibly be supported. They can't possibly be uh, within our claimed guarantees. That's a different thing than supported. I mean, they can't possibly. This, this, I don't think we can make decisions based on that I, off of the project. It, like, we can't say, well, we have these compatibility guarantees, but somebody is doing something where they were running 1.0 cluster uh, nodes against 1.15 API servers. Um, that, that is not a good reason to not advance the, the health of the general project. I, think I, I agree. So I, I wasn't arguing against yeah. making this the default and pushing on this. And I, I'm not arguing for making GKE drive uh -huh. any of these decisions. I was just saying anecdotally on GKE, we've seen some stuff like this. I'm wondering yeah. if it exists elsewhere and should we provide some flexibility if possible? Right. So maybe flag feature flagging it or uh, flag gating this. Yeah, I, I'd have to think. I haven't really thought about it. What would what would the uh, criteria for promoting that flag be if if we're already all, right within a supported all the criteria? Default. Yeah, I think it would be a default on flag. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to keep all the old code around. An escape latch for the people who are aware and 
uh, in a terrible place. <laughs> I mean, we, we have similar, there's a similar thing came up with uh, Damon set scheduling um, where basically a 113, a 113 master, or sorry, a 113 scheduler will try to schedule daemon sets using API fields that only 111 kubelets know about. Um, and so it's like, what's the release note for that look like? Does it look like uh, only 111 kubelets will work with 113 API servers because we support two versions and we really meant it? <laughs> like I, I mean, it, it's kind of reminding people that this is the supported window. Before you upgrade to 113, all your kubelets should be at least 111. I, I agree in some, maybe some leniency if it's three releases instead of two. However, when you get to seven releases, that's where I start to say, well, it's been two years. Yeah, I, it just gets really squishy, right? Like, so for the kubelet deleting thing, um, we know the last version of kubelets that would attempt to delete themselves. Should we remove the ability for them to do that once we don't support kubelets older than that? Um, or should we like wait an extra release just to be kind? And if you do that, then what really is our compatibility skew? I, yeah, it sounds like a SIG, SIG architecture discussion. Okay, so in this case, we are not like three versions away. We're six, seven, seven versions away. Um, so I don't think this is like a, should we break you right on the two release boundary or wait till three? This is a, you're a year and a half old. I think we've been incredibly lucky so far that we haven't had to make any of these decisions yet that are, we know this will hard break you and we're going to do it. Uh, most of the questions I had around the change were around like the performance and feature capabilities. So just double checking with storage, SIG storage that projected volumes do all the same things we currently get from secrets, like live updating values and how they deal with read-only values and things like that. Um, I, I think all of those are fine. But They uh, look to be the same implementation. So they use the same underlying uh, infrastructure package differently in the API. So I, I think it's similar. We can definitely double check with somebody who wrote it. Um, other than the kubelet breakage, as a consumer, like a person with pods and stuff, I assume you notice no difference, right? It's just files on disk. Uh, yes. Well, so the, what the admission controller fills in will look different when you look at the pod. Uh, so you won't have a randomly named value, uh, for a volume, uh, or a generated volume name. You'll actually have a, a static volume name, which I think is an improvement. Um, and, uh, if you were depending on a randomly named secret volume, uh, your you would break. I actually, I'm not sure whether we should continue naming it randomly. If you name it in a fixed way, then people can start referencing the volume mount, assuming the admission plugin will inject this named volume, which is a little wacky. So you uh, are I have the the current PR out uh, does not name it randomly. Are you okay. saying that we should not name it randomly or we should continue to name it randomly? If you pick a fixed name, then that name is an API. Yes. Uh, if we don't intend for it to be an API, then we should not pin it yet. Right. You, so can, I, go, you can go from a, a random name. If you have a random name, no one can depend on it. So that's why we have the freedom to stop yeah. injecting this randomly named secret volume today because people we know people aren't depending on it because it's different in every one we, we know no one has manifests that like have volume mounts that reference this volume that we currently inject 
So my ideal situation is the, so I have a reason for wanting to name it uh, with a static well-known name. Uh, I would like for eventually uh, uh, to disable auto mounting. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't really want to have the conversation about it now because I think it's going to be a huge conversation, but in the case where we do turn off auto mounting, uh, people can use the static name to inject the uh, access token into pods that they care about um, without, uh, with, while also having portability. So right now you can't actually do that uh, portably because that name is generated. Mm. Yeah, so it is also an option that we name it randomly now and decide to make it a static name eventually. Yeah, I think that that preserves status quo without uh, committing to a decision. <laughs> a decision, but still moves us towards projected, moves us towards um, moves us towards being able to swap in the token projection. I don't know. Any anyone else have thoughts on that? Clayton, I see you snarking yeah, in the background. Yeah, Mo and I had a long conversation yesterday about like this whole topic, and we were talking more about the the API of the the secrets and tokens we create um, less than the the mount. But I I really do prefer to very intentionally, we should intentionally walk into creating new APIs. Like our three inside pod APIs that are implicit are service links, the token, the contents of the secret dir, and um, there was one more and I keep forgetting what it is. Anyway, we have two in implicit accidental ones and both of them were like, oh wow, we wish we hadn't made these implicit. And so like we should be, I would prefer to be very, like only make things APIs in the behavior that we really want to be APIs. Like if we can all, as you said, we can always go from generated to static. We will never be able to take it away. If, if that, if we can figure out a way that that helps us uh, like in an opt out or sorry, opt in switch, then that might be interesting to sketch out and think through, but unless we're pretty confident we're going to use it that way, I really don't want people writing manifests to this yet. Let's uh, defer that choice. I think it's a good direction uh, and let's not slip into an API. Okay. All right, uh, that sounds good. I will make those changes. Anybody uh, have anything else? What is yeah, the so. config map controller that was referred to earlier and what does it do or should yes. do? Uh, essentially, we are uh, creating a separate controller to publish the root certificate in uh, all namespaces as a config map. And are we expected to then use the projected volume to combine the config map and the secret data or the token data, but not? have to reduplicate the CA data across every secret and make me sad. That's the, uh, that's the goal. Okay. I'll still probably be sad, but. <laughs> so, um, so the question, uh, one of the things Mo and I discussed yesterday, which touches on the API is like the fact that we generate a token, even with a random name that's accessible via the service account as the first link, right? Get the service, get the token for the service account. We have that behavior in extended tests. We have there's various people out there who've done things like picking up the secret that they should use for a service account. Um, there is a question about whether that we could even change the take the CA data at secret because anybody today who's walking that and gets the secret data out would be broken by the CA data changing. So um, I, I don't. I, Go ahead. Go ahead. So Go ahead. I, I, 
ours are is it a api because we just said that it's not an api because it has a random name i know i'm just I, I, the the it's so the, i think there's two classes there's implicit apis that people depend on because it's there and they get value out of it there's explicit apis explicit apis we definitely don't break implicit apis we have never taken a very hard line one way or another but like the side effect of like, if someone wants to get a service account token today, there's two ways. You can create the empty secret and set the annotations, which we never really documented as an explicit API, but I know people use that sometimes in clever ways. And then there's the, uh, the more uh, magic way, which is go get the service account, find the first one. And we use that in our extended tests, right? Like if we use it in our extended tests, because that's the only way to get a service account token, I can guarantee you there's probably a lot of infrastructure out there depending on it. Even if it's an implicit API, should we break it? Or do we have to go through some set of process where we say it's opt-in to stop setting the CA data on a cluster? Um, we don't cover it as part of conformance today, but conformance doesn't cover a lot of things that would break people if they changed. And so I think this is just a really, like this is a discussion that I don't want to take the cigar until we kind of think what we reasonably is the answer. We're going to make the world a better place, but you're going to break some people on the way if we take away CA data out of the secrets and being able to quantify who we're going to break or detect it or give them a choice. Yeah. I so expect that though, we would never yeah. take CA data out of the secrets. I expect that we would stop creating the secrets as they exist today all at once. Um, I am not sure how that migration looks right now. Um, I think it's important to think about, uh, however, um, it, I agree that it might require, uh, an API version bump. Yeah. If that's kind of what you're saying. We, I'm trying to think of something similar that we've tried to take away that was an implicit API. We didn't do it for service account links. Um, and there's nothing like when we changed how uh, like replication controllers, like label selectors on services, so like services still have the old label selector format, right? You can't do match expressions or um, yeah, match expressions, but replica sets can use that and deployments can, and, but we didn't fix services. So it's another like, we went through this whole big discussion about should we break people and we decided not to break people. Is this different or the same? But that's actually in, in the API. That's a field in a V1 core API versus some behavior of a controller that is shipped as part of the controller manager where we're generating random. Would, would a user of the, would an administrator of the cluster make that, that distinction? I mean, I, I kind of agree. Like, I, I agree with what we're trying to do. We're trying to make all this better because it was an implicit thing. We just have never done. We, we haven't. We don't have a good rule of thumb. How do we build those rules of thumb? How do we build like the criteria that we use to make this decision and make sure that people aren't broken? That we've justified it. Right. I think the importance is minimizing impact and having justifiable reasons for making changes that we know will break users, even though we didn't explicitly guarantee the behavior. Yeah, and, and doing it over a long enough period of time communicated well enough, probably with, when, when we have the ability to turn off the auto-created secrets, um, like having the ability to turn that off, probably before we do it by default, saying, this is a thing we'd like to do. If you want to run this way, to turn this on, or when you, when you opt into uh, doing token generation, you opt into this. Um, I'm not sure how we, would, how we would do it. But then giving people a way to say, does, does this break me? Um, and, like start getting feedback and data. Uh, I think looking at what we do in our end-to-end -end and conformance tests would probably be informative, like how if we if we turn this off, would it break us? Um, yes. Because we're probably pretty representative of uh, 
the kinds of hoops you'll jump through just to get the data you need. And people probably have looked at our EDE tests and performance tests and they're like, oh, I guess that's how you get a credential for a service account. I, I would argue that we're probably more extreme as far as depending on internal details of the system. Yeah. I, like, so there's a couple of examples in like OpenShift. So OpenShift, there's a, a helper CLI command that's like, hey, I want to get a token for the service account because it's the thing that like 99% of people do. We never put that, we ne that never got um, proposed as a cube thing, but the heuristic it, it did was get, it's the same thing that extended tests do, get the first service account secret uh, token off of the service account. Um, and that I know a lot of people use in automation. That is not impossible to go recreate in a number of different ways. And so I, just my gut would be there's a bunch of people out there who've done that in subtle ways. Um, fortunately, it'll fail pretty fast for them eventually when we switch. Um, is there an analogy here to both RBAC and pod security policy, which is turning RBAC on broke? Like, it's funny how all this comes out of SIG auth. I feel like we're going to get dinged for that, but like well, turning RBAC on changed the implicit behavior of the cluster. We didn't, we didn't enable it by default. It's still not enabled by default. A deployment has to do it. Deployment operators took that on themselves to break their customers because the trade-off was there. So Cube made the distinction that we have offered this, but it is not a default. You must opt into it. And then same people opt into it because of course security is worth a little bit of pain. That the rationale. I mean, there, there's a reason that the default, if you just run an API server, RBAC is not enabled by default. Certainly, we have said that the reason why we're taking these service account tokens out of secrets is to make the cluster more secure. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's secure, it's security and performance. So I think someone who has a cluster that is getting crushed by their root CA being in a trillion places is going to be really interested in like opting into this and say, please stop generating a trillion secrets. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, the security thing, like we we would like to see that happen, but I can I could see letting people opt into it. Um, I think the hard the hard call is going to be for uh, like people who set up clusters on other people's behalf. So uh, which should Cube Adam do? You know what should Cops and OpenShift should and GC like should they turn this on? They're not the ones who are going to be impacted by it necessarily. Do we should we write up like the distinction that we're trying to draw here between an implicit explicit and behavioral API, which is like, hey, our learnings are, we have these explicit APIs that we're not breaking. We are implicitly breaking this and there's a behavioral break and here's why we're choosing that to make this better in the future for other people to reason through. Yeah, I mean, the deprecation policy talks about like behavior, changing behavior in visible ways and kind of the time frame. It doesn't say you can't do it. It just says, here's, here's the time frame you have to do it over. Like you have to communicate it and announce it and like give people a heads up and say, if you're doing X, you must start doing Y by this date. Um, I mean, that, if we want to start, like once we have the sort of the new way available for people to switch to, um, then we actually have something we can tell them to start using. Uh, yep. I, we can tell people, like if people are using, um, kind of following these implicit links today to obtain credentials to use like for some CI system or something, they should really be explicitly creating a secret and saying, yeah. I want, I want a credential, please fill this and then obtain it that way. Like we, we could tell, start, we could start telling people to do that now. Um, I don't know. I, I think the big, the big thing is communication and doing it over a long enough time period that there's time for people to hear the communication and react to it and kind of understand the impact on them and make changes before we pull the rug out from under them. We don't want to do that. I'd also like to understand the difference between an implicit API and an implementation detail. If we're going to go through the, that process. Up until last week, you could send a SSH authenticate message to live SSH server and you would be authenticated. <laughs> Is that an API? Yep. <laughs> Contrived example. I don't know if you guys saw the CV. Yeah, that was a fantastic CV. <laughs> uh, but 
Yeah, I think there's a there are fuzzy lines that I don't understand, and right now there's opinions about them. And I, I have a feeling this is a great example of us clarifying what we consider an API and getting the language around it tightened up so that we have air cover, but also demonstrating how we communicate to users. Because this is like the like I, I think along with like turning on pod security policy by default or something, or operators turning it on, this would be probably one of the bigger implicit behavior changes we've done. Our back then PSP than this. I agree. Um, let's uh, let's move on and and uh, follow up offline. Uh, we have a couple more items. So um, next uh, design of note is the KEP uh, authority delegation KEP. Um, I jotted down uh, an initial uh, proposal on how to uh, propagate authority from uh, an end user uh, down to all subcontrollers needed to uh, actuate uh, the end user's desired uh, desired outcome. Uh, has anybody had a chance to look at it? If not, we can just have it be an announcement. Yeah, Mike, I, it looks kind of RBAC specific to me, but you do make reference to uh, any authorizer that supports authority delegation. So I was wondering how you saw that working, because it, it looks like some of the pieces refer to things like cluster roles. Yeah, so I, I think um, the, the delegation that we are looking for is a set of permissions which are not RBAC specific. Um, uh, any authorizer can be knowledgeable or returns knowledge of a sets of permissions. Uh, the it is not meant to be RBAC specific. Um, the the delegation is this actual persisted object. Uh, or uh, the in the in the case of the explicit authority delegation, it's a object stored in etcd that has a set of permissions uh, with an end user principle. Maybe not the end user principle, maybe the terminal principle, the, the creator of the initial delegation and uh, the uh, delegates and the delegates can use uh, some set of permissions associated with the delegation. Uh, the idea is you have this terminal principle. Uh, it creates, a, it, it extracts a set of permissions from its overall authority uh, and hands that set of permissions off to a friend to uh, take actions on, on their behalf. So in the case of an end user creating a replica set, they would give the replica set permission to create pods, uh, which they have. Um, uh, and the replica set could go off and create pods uh, that those permissions can be attenuated by a namespace. Uh, they may eventually be able to be attenuated by um, other conditions, such as I think a pod template might be a useful permission uh, or att attenuation. So I'm giving permission to this replica set controller to create uh, pods of a very specific form. Um, and the idea is now we have uh, a sync loop of a, the replica set controller that is using a very specific authority uh, that it has been delegated to manage that, um, manage that uh, replica set. And uh, it cannot go and create namespaces in that sync loop uh, in, another, in another namespace or uh, of another form. Um, or with a different image. Uh, so we are, we are restricting authority of individual sync loops and I isolating individual sync loops. Um, and uh, I think a really good situation to be would be uh, you cannot, a, replica, a replication controller process cannot create uh, namespaces where replica sets are not, don't exist. Um, we can have a Helm deployment that is shared across the cluster. And if you are not using that Helm deployment, uh, you are, you, your namespace uh, is, is not manageable by Helm. Um, moving from this model where we have this, these controllers with unilateral permission to uh, with basically root in cluster uh, to uh, very scoped uh, special purp purpose permissions. I think that protects us against um, both bugs and controllers where they can act 
can be tricked into misusing their unilateral authority and also um, uh, uh, problems with uh, if the helm deployment is uh, some, somehow you are able to exfiltrate credentials, you uh, limit the scope of, of, what, um, of what that help controller can do. Um, so these authority delegations are, uh, have that end user principle of delegates and uh, that authority delegation, uh, a checker or an authorizer of, uh, that uses, uh, is authorizing an authority delegation would uh, check the permissions are granted by the authority delegation, check uh, that the uh, authenticated user is allowed to use the authority delegation in the list of delegates. And um, that, that is, would be the selected authority for the specific action taken by the controller. Um, and you can, there's a process for creating multiple delegations from a single delegation. So um, that's the general idea. I think it's a big change. Um, so I'm proposing it end of uh, 2018. I expect it will take uh, just as long as it took to uh, implement the token, token changes, um, which was all of 2018 uh, to get this far. So um, I, I think it's a natural state that Kubernetes began with, with root, root permission and root users and no authorization. And I am hoping that we can uh, improve the situation uh, to, to harden Kubernetes um, over the long term. So another sort of thing I was wondering if you had thought through is uh, deletes and or garbage collection or something to, how do these things go away? Uh, deletes are not uh, a, a huge concern for me. Um, I, I'm very focused on creates and updates. I, I wasn't worried about the permissions around deletes. I was thinking more when I delete a replica set does the authority delegation that was created for me also disappear? Or does the replica set controller continue to have my delegated permissions for eternity? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, there's a couple ways to handle these scenarios. Uh, I would like to uh, garbage collect unused authority delegations. So suppose you have an, a delegation that hasn't been used in two weeks or a month. Uh, we should delete it or expire it. Um, uh, I think the act of using it is, uh, is enough to say that w we should keep this alive. I want to avoid situations where you have a team member who creates a replica set, uh, that team member is deauthorized, um, and the replica set is, becomes unmanaged or unmanageable by the replica set controller. Um, However, I would like uh, the audit to audit log to uh, express information of the of the authority at, uh, of which the replica set is is being managed. So I would expect that in the audit log you would see well uh, this user has or uh, this administrator has left the team, but we have uh, traces of uh, actions being taken on their behalf still. Um, similarly, if you do a list of the um, authority delegations, which are persisted objects, uh, you can see which uh, traces of their, uh, which authority delegations uh, exist that lead back to them. So an authority delegation is a permission check at a point in time that, that grants uh, a set of permissions to a, a new principal. Um, uh, they are revocable in that you can just keep control, delete the authority delegation uh, if you so choose. Um, and uh, they will hopefully expire and will be garbage collected. Uh, I think potentially deleting a replica set is a good, uh, would be a good time to delete authority delegated uh, on the creation of that replica set, um, which is not explored in the kept yet, but I can certainly add that. Yeah, I think there's probably something we could come up with. I was kind of thinking through comparing and contrasting what you could do today with the existing RBAC primitives. Cause you could say that the replica set controller has no powers until I create a role binding that binds to the replica set controller cluster role in my namespace. And so you could 
do that two-step process where before you can create a functional replica set, you must also have a namespace admin granted the powers. And then you, you at least get the baseline authorization level of these things have no power until I decide to give them power in my namespace. You lose the other pieces, which are slightly more protection against uh, confused deputy where like even in that, you, you could just accidentally go to a different namespace that is also using it and do the wrong thing, whereas it's slightly harder to do that if you also have to carry along the right authority selector and you also don't get the nice auditing thing. So I think there are, there are benefits to exploring this. I was wondering if, it, if, it, if there are any explicit authorization guarantees that we get out of it though. What do you mean by explicit authorization guarantees? Is there any is there any claim that we can definitively make to say authorization with authority delegation is more secure than authorization with pre-provisioned granular RBAC? Well, findings? aren't the two statements that you had? We have uh, we have. Uh, provenance of authority in audit, and we have uh, the guarantee that actions taken uh, on behalf of uh, a terminal user terminal principal are, um, must be explicitly uh, in the context of uh, actuation of, of their desired, um, or what they desired. Uh, I, you, you covered both of those. I think those are both explicit improvements over just creating uh, uh, namespaced role bindings for the replica set controller. Yeah, for sure. I think they're definitely explicit improvements. Uh, the auditing one is nice. I think it, it's a little bit separate from authorization. And then the, <laughs> there are fewer confused deputy bugs is an authorization benefit, but you, you can't say there is no possible confused deputy. You just have to say the confused deputy has to do slightly more bad things. I, I think it greatly minimizes that issue. Uh, especially once we have even stronger scoping uh, attenuation. So we're actually out of time. Uh, I'd love to talk about this more with anybody who's interested. Um, it's a very early, in a very early state. Um, we have two more items, which I think I'll just announce because we're one minute over. Uh, we wanna get the, um, uh, get uh, TLs seeded and we wanna get the subprojects merged and updated owners files in the next, um, a uh, short period. So let's prioritize that. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, see you all in two weeks.